All right, let's get started. And just a very warm welcome to you. I'm joined by Debra Schmita. Um, Debra Schmita, hello. Um, <clears throat> We're going to talk today about theory of change. Um, can you, you, do theories of change make your heart beat faster? Is this something that, uh, that is, um, yeah, something that, that really gets you excited? Yeah, it does. I mean, um, it's a way to think about what a project can deliver as opposed to what a project could do, which can be a big open Pandora's box of different things. And, um, and as somebody who designs project projects, it helps me keep the focus. And then if I read a project that is designed by someone else, it also helps me understand what that project is aiming to do faster in a way. Right. So I guess it makes your heart beat faster in a, in a positive way. Let's say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it does. It does instill fear in a number of people, um, because it sounds strange. It sounds weird. We don't quite know what it is. So we hope we're going to dispel all the myths around theory of change. Talk about what they really are. Um, Debra Schmita, um, you're a consultant here at Eco. Do you want to say a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. So I've been with Eco two years now, and we deliver um, pro projects on clim um, for climate finance, uh, the big climate fund. So you have Green Climate Fund, Global Environment Facility Adaptation Fund. We do a lot of market assessments, um, baseline studies, feasibility studies, pre-feasibility studies, which all involve a lot of thinking around the core elements of a project that we often use a theory of change approach to um, settle in on. Um, I primarily work on the Green Climate Fund um, project design with uh, my colleagues at ECO, and I recently worked on the successful Vanuatu project that was funded a couple of weeks ago. Um, my background is also in gender mainstreaming for climate finance, particularly climate adaptation, and it's great to be here today with you, Grant. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name my name's Grant. You probably um, twig that, um, notice that in my um, in my byline here. I'm the director of the company Eco, um, which I set up now. It's 22 years ago, I think. Um, and ever since that time, even before I started Eco, I really did specialize in project and program design. Um, so I've got quite a lot of experience, more than 20 years um, experience in project design. But I guess it was something like 10 years ago when I developed, I was getting into theory of change. There were more and more funds asking um, for a theory of change. And I, I made a theory of change. I showed it to a, a monitoring and evaluation specialist. She took one look at it and said, in your theory of change, there is no theory. Um, so I was a little bit taken aback by it. Um, but I think I now understand what she was talking about. And so we're going to talk about the theory behind the theory of change. What makes it more than just a pretty diagram with some arrows here and there? What makes it into, into something more? Debra Schmita mentioned the project in Vanuatu that was approved very recently. You worked on the theory of change for that one um, and many others mm -hmm. since then and before then. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, ECO as a company works on developing project proposals, programs for our clients. And we've set up this group, which we call ECO Institute, which is the training arm of ECO, because we really believe we're, we're a group of passionate people that want to bring about change in the world. And we really believe that um, passing on the knowledge an understanding of how climate fund finance works. This might be multilateral climate finance. It could be private sector climate finance. Well, how does it work? Passing on that knowledge is just so important. It helps us in our work. It helps our clients. It helps everyone um, move forward. And that's what we are really passionate about, making a difference in the world. 
So that's the Eco Institute. Let's get down to um, the detail of our presentation. So I'm going to just um, share my presentation. Um, we are going to um, ask a number of polls as we go along. So you'll see the polls um, available for you to answer. And if I'm not mistaken, someone in the team can correct me. There is a poll already available right now. It's looking like it's available for submitting votes. It says, how do you rate your level of knowledge on theories of change? Um, ninja, practitioner, occasional user, or novice. So if you're completely new to it, choose the novice one. If you're um, an occasional user, you've done it a few times, choose that one. If you're a practitioner, go for that option. And um, if you're a ninja on it, then um, please do um, uh, vote on it. And Yeah, OK, great. So um, yes, let me share my screen. All right, so what are we going to cover today? We're going to really um, go over four points. Firstly, make a brief introduction to theory of change, how it fits into the bigger picture, project design. We're going to talk about the difference between theory of change and logical framework. Then we're going to show and explain a seven step process for preparing a theory of change. And finally, because many of you will know, I think, that um, theories of change are um, something that is required by GCF, Green Climate Fund projects. Um, and Deborah Schmitta, you were just referring to Green Climate Fund project that you were working on with a theory of change. We're going to talk about theory of change in GCF projects. They're a little bit different um, from some theories of change. They've got a quite a strict format, so we'll talk about that. How does that sound? Good, Deborah Schmitter, any comments to make at this stage? Nope, and no. you're just seven steps, so. <laughs> just the seven steps, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all. But you're gonna see the seven steps actually cover a whole lot of ground. I mean, it's really yeah. comprehensive, going from nothing to going to a completed theory of change. So it's very comprehensive. If you're already working on the design of a project, you may find that you already have a number of the steps somewhat covered already. Okay. Um, just let's look at the theory of change within the bigger picture of um, developing a project. At ECO, we like to see really three main um, steps that are important for, um, for designing any project. At some stage in the project program, you need to do a baseline assessment. So that's sort of where we start off on. We may do stakeholder analysis, policy analysis, developing a problem tree and a barrier. Once you have a good understanding of the baseline, you're able to start putting forward a strategy. That's sort of a second step. And then the third step is once you've done that strategy, you turn it into a fundable project design, the third step. Now, I've painted them out as though they're steps that you walk through, but we never follow one step and then the next step, do we, Deputy Meter? No, it's uh, sometimes in tandem, and then sometimes we are reworking a little bit of the baseline assessment depending on you know, what are the sort of barriers we uh, find and how do you want to develop the adaptation intervention. But I think the whole idea is that being actually flexible and not linear is, or and having elements of adaptive management is what makes for good project and program design. Okay, great, yeah. Um, absolutely, it's adaptive and in fact it doesn't go we we often start off with a project idea or a strategy that comes from a client we jump over here we do some stakeholder analysis we change the plan the theory we bring in some new ideas and we 
explore what the budget looks like that we might do over here. And then we go back and think more about the strategy. And then we go and analyze the problem in a bit more detail. So it's all over the place. <laughs> We're jumping backwards and forwards. But conceptually, you have three things you need to do. You need to understand how the market works, how things currently work. You need to understand and come up with a method for bringing about change in that market, whatever it is. And you need to turn it into an action plan. And those are the three steps that we're talking about here. And in the middle of this is the results framework or the theory of change. It's what you can see in the middle here. I'm going to turn on a different color so that you can see what I'm talking about, this results theory and theory of change aspect. A results framework is one aspect, often it's called a log frame or a logical framework, is a results framework, and the theory of change. And they're closely related to each other. So what is a theory of change? Essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a theory of how and why. And I'm going to talk about how and why lots during this session. So it's how and why a given intervention brings about uh, a given change and leads to a specific change. Important to note that, you know, theory change are not, uh, it's not just magic and it's not really a tool. It's a process and an approach. Dibish Mita. Yeah. Um, so in a way, it's almost a process and an approach that also facilitates uh, stakeholder ownership. Um, projects and programs usually involve multiple stakeholders. And theory, I find, um, and we found at ECO, that theories of change are an important process in which you can get all those stakeholders together who have different influence and interests in terms of what the project and program is going to be and almost develop a map, a pathway um, to what is the agreed upon um, destination, the, so the overall project and program um, objective. And it's also, in a way, particularly suited to climate change type of work, um, designing climate change interventions, because climate change in itself is such a multifaceted, complex problem. Um, and you really want to be asking the question what this project and program can do as opposed to what. Uh, so you want to be asking the question what this project can deliver as, op as opposed to what it can do, which can be a very wide um, range of um, interventions. So I think that is where a theory of change is very useful. Yeah, absolutely. Participation is really key element of, of it. And it's a, a method, a, a place where you can have dialogue about the process. And um, that makes a huge difference for logical framework and theory of change for both of these um, types of approach. Now, I said we'd talk about how and why, and I like this little cartoon. Um, you may have seen it already. Uh, it's a cartoon of uh, two, two mathematicians doing some equations, and then a miracle occurs, and then you get um, some next step. There's just magic happening in the middle. And the caption is, I think you should be a bit more specific here in step number two, because when we're trying to mobilize climate finance, we need to think very carefully about the change that we're bringing about. I mean, this is this is precious money that can really make a difference to people's lives. It needs to be spent wisely. We need to understand what is happening in that miracle moment when change is brought about, what is happening in that middle step. And it's about understanding the how and the why of change, not just what we expect to happen, but why we expect that change to happen. If we don't do that, it's hard to know if it works, why, and this comes from a monitoring point of view. If you don't know why it works, you don't have a theory of why this intervention is going to work, then you can't, um, you know, you can't easily tell why that happened. And of course, if it fails, it's also hard to know why. And that's crucially important as well. We need to understand that basis on which the logic of our project is, 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 is formed. Now, when we think about this sort of theory of change, we, we often get um, unclear about the difference between the, these two elements of a logical framework 
and a theory of change. Now, a logical framework. I'm just going to I'm just going to draw them up here um, on this screen, and we're going to start over here with um, a logical framework. Um, all right, so log, it's often just abbreviated to log frame, and you might well know it from the Matrix type of idea, not the Matrix movie. Um, I'm a big fan of the Matrix movie, but not from that movie. It's really a four by four matrix that people talk about, which goes from, could be inputs at the bottom, but we essentially we have activities here, and then we have some outputs of the project, then we have outcomes, and at the top we have impacts. Yeah, it's a results framework. We do activities, we deliver results that are outputs, we deliver outcomes, we deliver impacts. So that's sort of the log frame approach. And then we have something that is called the theory of change. I'm just going to abbreviate it as the theory of change. And instead of just this, this more, I suppose, straightforward or simple structure of activities to impacts, we have with a, with a theory of change something which tells us the big picture. Um, it's, a, it, it's more than just the log frame, this sort of structure. It's a big picture view, not just a description of the logic. We've already, I've already emphasized this is all about how and why. So I can't emphasize enough that we're talking about both of these aspects, whereas a log frame is principally about how change is going to happen. So, you know, it's a, it's a linear structure. So this one is linear. And the log frame is focused on the how of change. So there is a lot of relationship. We will have common elements to both of these, but it's quite something, something different to add in that extra element of why we think. And we often say that a theory of change can answer well, can be used to fill in a question, and that is written like this. If, if we do X, so whatever the activity is, installation of improved water um, storage systems, for example, rainwater harvesting systems, if we do it, then we'll get X, then we'll get a, a result, could be improved water resilience. I'm going to call it Y for now. And the key here is because. Because of something. And it's why we think if we do X, then we'll get Y. Whereas on the log frame side, a little bit different because we're saying we plan to do X and we're going to result have a result of why yeah that's a major difference we often see theories of change i've shown you already the log frame is sort of a matrix but theory of change is usually got feedback so if you have different blocks um we we can see that there might be feedback from this activity or this output that impacts on another activity things the world is complex, as Deborah Schmitty, you were saying. The world's a complex, complex mix. And theory of change tries to capture that, that there are feedback mechanisms, there are processes. You might well say, okay, what this delivers, and we might we might draw a picture of a of a process in it. You know, there's a process that's going to follow and out of the process. My funnel's, I suppose, going the wrong direction, but out of the process, we're going to get certain certain outputs. So you can be creative in building up that theory of how things go. And maybe I've labored it already too many times, but this includes um, evidence. Hopefully you can read my handwriting there. That's evidence. Here we've talked about it already in terms of the process. It's really intended to be a linear step-by-step -step then you have these outputs that produce these outcomes. And generally, there's no evidence here. 
Okay. Yeah, how are we doing? Are there any questions? Let's just check in briefly because we're gonna now dig in to um, the some sort of detail. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. There's a question about access to the presentation. Yes, we're going to send round a a, a a recording, and the and the 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 slide deck and everything so that you have it all. That'll be made available at the end. Thanks for the questions. There is a questions tab. Feel free to ask your questions in there as we go. All right. Um, great. So, shall we move on, Deborah Schmita? Yes, let's. Okay. Here are the steps. Um, we said there were quite a few. <laughs> Just seven. Um, yeah, only seven. Only I mean, seven. the first ones, the first ones, situation analysis. So, this is the baseline assessment, looking at what's there. We'll go into a little bit more detail just now. Then results mapping. And then I think, you know, change mechanisms. How are we going to bring about change? What are the sequence of the steps? And then we get to a theory of change diagram. So there's a whole lot of work that's taking place before. Um, so, um, so, so that's sort of ahead of ahead of the, the the ahead of actually drawing a diagram and then identifying the supporting evidence and preparing the narrative it's also one of these ones where it seems linear but it's not just linear yes it, it connects back to step one like you should be collect having some of that already when you've done step one yeah yeah we yeah. often collect a lot of the evidence as we're digging into this because you can't say here's our change mechanism when we don't have any evidence of whether it'll work and how it'll work so so that's a, that's an important aspect for it okay um now um joseph i see you've asked um uh, and joseph joseph sorry i wasn't uh, i need to adjust my glasses here is the structure theory of change related to mathematical thinking and pathways what do you think Debbie Schmitter? if not mathematical certainly logical and rational so um, yeah so it's, it's all about logic it's all about yeah. the relationship between different things and why there's that relationship we're going to dig into that um, as we go through these steps so the first one situation analysis yeah um, um so in this uh step you you ought to be developing sort of a good understanding of the issue that the project will tackle, um, what your organization brings to the situation, why is it relevant to you, why would you want to work on that topic, um, and what might be the best course of action, which can include um, sort of a preliminary assessment of your interaction with the different stakeholders, your research on the ground. And to carry out this analysis, we um, use different tools so context reviews and um, stakeholder uh, sectoral reviews we uh, conduct stakeholder consultations and analysis um, capacity assessments of different institutions that are involved and development of a problem tree right problem yeah, tree great yeah problem tree we can talk more about those as a sort of um diagrams of things um gift is asking a question um how can we include a theory of change in a climate finance project which is collaborated with the private sector how can we ensure that they understand the importance and why it matters um you know we've been talking mostly about something which is if not in the public sector it's about multilateral climate finance isn't it mm -hmm. So what yeah. do we do when there's private sector parties there? Um, so I interpret this question as um, like, how would private sector um, understand uh, or see the value of a theory of change? I mean, in a way you're almost making, you can even make a business case for doing something through a mm -hmm. theory of change, uh, in, in my opinion. So if you're working on um, a deforestation project and you have a private sector entity that that's involved that wants to do better um you demonstrate through your through your theory of change you have you know you have the main benefit of probably reducing or halting deforestation say in a rubber supply chain but then you have also the benefit of scaling up sustainable rubber and that is 
an important um, in, important supply chain that is not going to go away. It's where it's it's used in different industries, and so you make that connection, and you use a theory of change to demonstrate that business case. Yeah, absolutely. So the 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 process of thinking about if we do these activities, we'll get these results, and why we think we'll get these results. That's very familiar to private sector. That's not something foreign. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's a big role for us to help to translate things that are maybe required by multilateral funds or national funds into something that can be understood by the private sector. Because all this about, um, well, things that are, go beyond the scope of what private sector is principally interested in are, are, very, are very foreign. Yeah, they, they, you know, I was working for 10 years in this sector before someone looked at my theory of change and said, in your theory of change, there's no theory. <laughs> so it's not something that I, I don't know. I don't think we really have to communicate it. We, we don't have to ensure that the private sector understand the result of it. In a way, we're doing it in order for our overall project program to be more effective but there's a real logical reason for doing it because your project will be more effective um, for any private sector party working in in remote rural perhaps part of a developing country they will need to understand for example that you know just to give an example when the principal the principal agent of change is in in many countries is women, not men. Yeah. And if the private sector just says we're going to target men, they've got money, let's 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 sell our product there, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be very effective. And thinking about what you do and why you do it to produce the result is what we all need to do because we want whatever money is spent to be more effective for the private sector too. Hopefully that's some useful insight into into that um, gift. It's a good question. Got lots of upvotes there. People are very interested in that, in that one. Okay, we will do some other um, questions. We'll come on to in just a moment. Let's push on to talk about the second step, which is the results map. Um, I've shown you this already as part of what we talked about for the logical framework, because the results map is how our activities deliver outputs that have outcomes and that have an impact. Outputs, you know, these are all technical terms that have got definitions. We don't need to worry too much about them, but we normally are seeing activities as this one is obvious. It's the stuff you do. The outputs are the stuff you deliver, concrete things, number of well, a training workshop, for example, is an output level thing. We're going to do 20 training workshops. Outcome is the one level beyond our control. What do we want as a result of that training workshop? We want enhanced knowledge, enhanced ability to do something, increased awareness of. So that's the outcome. But ultimately, we're looking for an impact, which for climate change project is either going to be reduced emissions or increased resilience or both. So that's the results map. Um, it's the rationale in a way of the project. So what are the project activities? If you're doing a project which is aimed at development, economic development in a region through improving school attainment, for example, but your project, your organization's got experience in water resilience, in agriculture, in education of children. What sort of activities might you be doing? What are those activities? Um, any any thoughts on, on, on what you'd be doing? Just think about it a little bit yourself so that you're you're involved in 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 the in the thinking it through, you know. We've got certain activities that we do yeah, in order to produce the change that we want, improved education of children, children, or maybe the impact is poverty reduction. Yeah, whoops, went too fast. So maybe the impact is poverty. 
reduction overall. Now, we're mapping the results. If it's a climate change project, we need to see climate change either at the top in terms of impact. This is mitigation. Oops, it's got to erase that mitigation. So this is reducing emissions, mitigation side. Or in terms of our logic, the impact is improved resilience. So it could be emissions reduced, or it could be resilience increased. Yeah, the population has greater resilience. And we know that resilience is very closely related to poverty as well, because when you're living in poverty, you have reduced options, your resilience is lower. So this is that part of that logic that is happening there at the top in terms of impact. So what, what might we do? The activities might be investments, The rainwater harvester, yeah, investing in villages for rainwater harvesting, it's an investment. What other are typical types of activities that you might do here? You want to put forward some ideas, Debashmita? Putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, sure. Um, awareness raising um, could yeah. be uh, the training of um, trainers. Who are involved yeah. in um, local governance and uh, governance entities um, relating to the water systems management? So then yeah. you're creating. Um, um, so the output you're having is that improved management skills of water yeah. systems. Yeah. So as you do these activities, you you deliver certain things, which could be improved management skills. It could yeah. be better water supply, more reliable water supply. Those sorts of things as you go through it and ultimately what we're going to deliver is improved resilience which might have an ultimate reduced poverty or the other way around we might reduce poverty which produces res improved resilience enhanced resilience so this type of result that you might see here so i mean why i've spent a bit of time talking about that is that our next step is about those change mechanisms we look at each of those outcomes that we want to bring about. So whatever it might be, it could be an interim outcome or output level type of thing. And we got to say, um, how do we want people to engage with these activities to make the outcomes more likely? How do we want that, that interface to work? Um, so for example, if our, if our plan or we, emerging theory says we want parents to prioritize education. What what might we do? What is the what are the things that we might do? Um, the activities that we might follow here, and how do we want people to engage with those? And it helps to look at each outcome in turn. Take a single outcome output and consider what will need to happen or how we want people to feel during those activities to trigger this outcome. And the idea of prioritizing is already, it's, it's introducing this idea of feeling or movement or change that we want to bring about. So here we, we, we're sort of in, in the process of doing, of doing this thinking here. So I'm gonna put up a, um, a, an activity that we might say, well, this activity links to parents prioritizing education. I'd like you to think it through, and I'm going to see if I can or if a member of the team can um, launch. Um, yes, launch a poll. I think I can do it. Um, so um, here we have one is how. Uh, no, will informing parents about climate change, we're going to inform parents about climate change, as you can see over here, will informing parents about climate change on water, food security and education, will that result in parents prioritizing education? What do you think um, there? Okay, um, so just go into the poll and quickly quickly give your vote. You can say, yes, it'll definitely um, 
move parents to prioritize. Um, secondly, um, the second one is option is that it might. Next one is definitely, oh no, I'm not doing them in the right order. Probably not. And the last one is definitely not. Okay, great. We're getting we're getting a quite a quite a clear um, uh, consensus from the votes. Um, at the moment, I'm seeing 44% of people are saying maybe, yes, maybe, um, and a similar percentage, 44% are saying probably not. Three people have said definitely, and one is saying definitely not. Um, Okay, we're getting that sort of pattern. It's it's quite similar. So people are choosing in between either yes, maybe, or no, probably, somewhere in between those two um, that are there. And I think I think you're right to be a bit skeptical about this, about this issue. Because you know, what is that link between information and the result? This is this is the why part of it. If we inform someone about something, will they take action? Now, I mean, there's some areas, aren't there, Devish Mita, where we, where we have information, but we don't act. Yeah, like exercise. It's exercise. Uh, yeah, good, that's a good, good one. for you, but do we do it every day? Yeah, <laughs> I guess everyone kind of knows. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows you should get exercise. We all know it, but do we all do it? Well, information is not enough. So informing people, I mean, it can have a difference. And in this case, I think, yes, there's a yes, probably there. Maybe we need to change the wording a little bit here about education, because what do we mean about informing them about climate impacts on education? And why would that mean that a parent is prioritizing? There's a big question there. So thinking more about that. And this person who, who told me, my theory of change has no theory, was all about saying, what's happening at this arrow? What is this link that links these two ideas that we can do one thing and we produce another result? So how do we, how do we make that link? Good. Um, and Irina, yes, thanks for, for inputting this. It depends on what their reason for inaction was in the first place. Yeah, that's very perceptive. Um, comment on it. Why were they not prioritizing education? What is the reason? If it was something related to this information, maybe it makes a change. Okay, so we move on to the next one, which is around sequencing. And then we're going to come back to that little point a little bit later. You'll see I added in a couple of words there, but perhaps not enough. It's what we need to think about. So Step number four is about sequencing. We've got, and I, we're just showing you an example here of all different ideas that are in the results chain. You can see this result chain that we talked about before. Here you can see some activities. Here you can see some outputs. Um, clean water supply secured, maybe this is an output or maybe it's an outcome. I'm just going to put out so that it doesn't matter which one it is, outcome or output. Reduced water-related illness. This is definitely at the outcome type of level. We always see outcome as sort of at the borderline of control. If we do certain things, some of the results that we generate are in our control. We can run a workshop. But some of the results we want, the use of that information as a result of the workshop, is just beyond our control or at the border of our control, and that we call the outcome. And here we've got an impact. It's not an exact science. One person's outcome is another person's impact, and one person's output is another person's outcome. We can discuss that um, sometime. But we've got that results chain, and what we now need to do is to start to put them in some sort of order. Well, we've got certain activities. We've put them in gold color. We're going to start to relate them um, and think about the sequencing on a deeper level. What is actually going to happen with this? 
And as we build up that sequence, we are able to see and conceive of a theory of change diagram. So this is just the diagram part of it. And we can see here that, well, some of them can be fairly simple, yeah, and some can be as sophisticated. But what is amazing here is that you can see that improved health and nutrition, which is which is up on the on the side here, improved health and nutrition. Yeah, it's got a feedback. So improved sec food security leads to improved health and nutrition. Improved health and nutrition leads to improved household income. We've got a a positive virtuous loop here an improved household income can lead to improved food security and to complete this step which is on the ne very next step we will we will build up the arguments that go into this what do you think Deborah Schmita? got some thoughts here or should we move on no um this is uh it's as you were saying it's a, it creates a virtuous cycle like um if, if, if looked at simply i mean india has a big program of midday meals at school which has a positive impact on attendance um then one can argue that um improved uh nutrition in school maybe helps in better retention of the information being given and then absolutely when you have an parallel uh investments say um libraries are improved um, it may not be that simply improving libraries increase, um, you know, um, in, increase uh, levels of access to books, reading, etc. When you have these things in parallel, you 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 have like an overall impact. So yeah, yeah. which is what we are trying to portray here, and you get up yeah. to that point of improved student performance. Yeah, absolutely. So these three. The three project activities that are here is just a tiny little bit of, of a bigger picture. And you don't need to make your whole diagram much more complicated, but you mentioned, Deborah Schmitter, about um, how um, free school meals can have an impact on attendance at school. Um, there are all sorts of other types of mechanisms that can enhance it, but increased nutrition improves learning ability within the school. So it's a virtuous. And I think the data shows that some sort of intervention like that can have you know at least a tenfold return on its investment if you were thinking from an economist point of view invest invest in the meals what is the result that you'll produce um, for the country now that's not specifically a climate action but it is a resilience action and it is possible through the rationale the thinking about the rationale to show how there is a link and a very strong link to climate change. And you'd need that strong link in order to establish um, what needs to be done. So what we're talking about of free school meals is not necessarily viable within a climate change project. Um, that funding may come from other sources. Okay. Um, I'm just having a quick look at some of the questions. I've seen your question, um, Dennis, about frameworks and experience for institutional strengthening. We'll come to that just now. Uh, Sergio, um, you were talking about the question before about the future advantages from implementing a climate change project. Yeah, I think um, maybe just very briefly uh, give an answer there. It says in relation to ongoing question, how about the future advantages for implementing the climate change project? Increased climate change adaptation might mean to less fossil fuels with competitive advantage on the market. This, you maybe put it in, in terms of that private sector logic of understanding why they wouldn't be engaging in understanding this type of theory of change. So, um, yeah, how do you see that? Of course, these projects often have multiple benefits. The one that we're looking at here um, is probably primarily a, a resilience project. It's improving community resilience, which has many co-benefits. We're going to talk about some of those co-benefits there. But also um, one can one can um, one can bring forward the argument of how this type of thinking can enhance the overall results. Hopefully I'm getting um, I may be coming to your question a little bit late in the in the day. Um, 
And Suzanne, you're making a very good point here that it seems like there's a lot of magic between poverty down, emissions down, resilience up. That was in this previous picture that I was um, showing Ray back here. I mean, I showed very easily poverty, emissions, resilience. When you're doing your work on the argument of the change that you're showing, you need to have a strong line without magic in between. How does improved resilience or reduced poverty result in improved resilience? And that's what we're coming to in terms of the logic. So that's that ne very next step um, for it. Um, you do need to unravel it and unravel it lots um, and a lot more detail and provide evidence that you know that this change in poverty produces another change in resilience. you have thoughts on that, Dipshmita? Well, if you're talking about linkages between these overall impacts, um, improvement um, in economic situation just makes you more ready to absorb shocks, right? So you have um, un some unpredictable shocks or uncertain shocks. We know climate change is happening, but um, it, it depends on your context. So um, if, uh, so in 2020, uh, where I'm from, I'm from Calcutta, which is a climate vulnerable city, there was a cyclone, the pathway was through the city and um, the, the shock was uneven depending on where in the city you were in informal settlement, um, as opposed to urban areas which are built up according to codes, uh, building codes. So um, definitely um, there is a connection between poverty, climate resilience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yes, as you were saying, yeah. these arrows is where the teasing out of all the details happen. Um, yeah. But in general, I, I do think um, improvement in economic situation makes you more able to absorb impacts of uncertain and uneven shocks. Yeah, yeah. and we've, we've got an instinct about it. it. It makes logical sense, but exactly as you're saying, Suzanne, you really do need to unpack this. and and show the evidence, find the evidence and show the evidence of how that links. I mean, Deb Schmidt, your example of, of results of, of a cyclone and how it affects different populations in different ways is, 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 you know, anecdotal evidence, but there is scientific basis to that, which you need to dig out. And that's our next step. So that is to identify and document the supporting evidence. That's what we, we're doing now to, to unpack that magic, develop the evidence and reasoning that we need for the narrative, um, explain why we believe that each block will lead on to the next one. And we make our assumptions explicit. What are we assuming here? You know, if we're saying that X will lead to Y change, for example, farmer school training <clears throat> on climate resilient agriculture will result in a great uptake of climate resilient practices and technology. Well, it seems logical, but will it? If we had training on letting people know that um, exercise is good for your health, it doesn't mean that everyone runs out and starts exercising. So um, we know that just that. So what is the what are we assuming here? We're assuming that people actually take some action as a result of the of the um, of the intervention. So we're going to try start making that explicit and provide the supporting evidence. Supporting evidence can be different types. We can say in the pilot project we were running for the last two years, we did these activities and we measured these impacts. This is some supporting evidence. Here's our feasibility study or our evaluation of our first pilot project. We did it in five villages. Now we're going to expand it. We have evidence. And we also have evidence from, from scientific literature. And you can search for that, find it. What is the evidence about improved nutrition and greater attainment of children in school? It's very solid evidence. You can, uh, you can dig it out and find it and reference it. So that's that next element. And then finally, this um, step seven is prepare that supporting nar narrative that talks about assumptions, evidence, and project logic.
we've got a few questions about GCF. Shall we jump on to the GCF question? Should we go on to the GCF now? Yeah. Um, so um, you've asked, um, let me just get it. Dennis, you said, are there generally agreed and standardized theory of change frameworks for practice? Um, I'm going to address that first part of your question. The second part, would you have experience doing theories of change for institutional strengthening projects for enhancement of climate finance mobilization? Um, briefly, some related experience, but perhaps not the very specific one that you're asking about, Dennis. But the first part, generally agreed frameworks. The whole thing about theory of change is that, they, that it is an approach more than a specific framework but since you ask it gcf have a framework that they require you to use for theory of change and we can see it mentioned in the concept note um in, it it says optional in a gcf concept note so we, we can optional supporting document can be provided as a diagram of the theory of change and in the full funding proposal yes definitely um, you need yes. to do it. And what about the what about the SAP, the simplified approval process, Debush Mito? Yes, um, in section D2, if I recall correctly. So we uh, yeah. would need for when you're doing a funding proposal, you would need a theory of change, whether it's um, a simplified approval process or a full funding proposal. Yeah, the wording is a little bit vague there, but I would yeah. strongly recommend submitting it. But they say, in terms of rationale, please briefly describe the theory of change and provide information on how it serves to shift the development pathway. That's that's the wording from the SAP template. Yeah, it doesn't explicitly ask for a diagram, but um, the, I, I would imagine the implication is please provide this one so you know we can. Absolutely. And it goes back to what I think we were discussing. It's, it also helps to understand why exactly you're proposing to do what you want to do. Yeah. So I would put good money on a bet that, in fact, um, they will ask for a diagram if you don't provide it. But uh, I might lose my money. I don't know. OK, so GCF requires it. And this is the template of how it must look. There is a narrative. They expect some description of the theory of change. But the diagram is a set type of diagram. Important, the latest um, integrated results management framework, IRMF, for the GCF, has added in co-benefits um, into the diagram at the outcome and co-benefit level. Um, it, it was a result of the of the framework, wasn't it? Anyway, they do want that now. Um, and they expect assumptions to be listed at the bottom, barriers in the middle, your project activities. Now what we're getting, if you look at this part, this is essentially a logical framework with some arrows between it. The arrows almost always i think actually i think always go up but there is nothing really that is stopping you from from putting a feedback loop i suppose what do you think devish it gets very complicated doesn't it when yes. you start putting in arrows all over the place exactly um i think i i, I find it useful when the activity sets speak to the output so you, instead of having individual activities you put them in a box so it's um yeah and why it leads to a certain output um yeah. and certain times two outputs might be related to each other for yeah. an um, outcome it really yeah. depends yeah. on what you're trying to design yeah there's a key word there is it talks about activity sets so you're not listing yeah. every single activity you exactly. have sets of activities there um i must just between us, I'm not a huge fan of this structure, but this is what we need to produce. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like making this rigid structure to it. And there's also a mystery up at the top about the goal statement. Goal statement, if then because. And as far as I know, yeah. GCF haven't published anything that says exactly what the if <laughs> then because actually means. Um, I think there's a, a recent IMRF handbook, which is giving a little bit more clarity on it um, but i think the accepted way or 
um, from recent experience is if so you have the outputs, so if a project does A, B, and C, then the goal, which is increased resilience of vulnerable communities in a certain context, will be reached because of this outcomes, which could be improved, say, governance, improved management, or improved access to technology. So you really have if outputs, then goal or project objective, um, because outcomes. Yeah. So what we do is if one, then two, because three and two, what I'm talking about here is the impact, the impact of your project. If we do these outputs, then we will get this impact because we have these interim outcomes. Yes. That's how it sort of fits together. And I think that's sort of the accepted way that it does. We, we put it in our proposals and they go forward. So we might, if local planning, decision-making, water management is in place, then there'll be improved climate resilience. That's our overall intended impact of the project and enhancement in vulnerable communities, improved water security in vulnerable communities because the things that we generate in the middle, because there's enhanced community awareness upgraded infrastructure and such like and you can show us that in the next um in the next slide um yeah. i can zoom in if you want Devashmita, on any of these do you want to talk about it very briefly we're pretty much out of time yeah i but, could just um, very yeah, quickly go over um, how we arrived at this so um going back to like the project goal state and the if and the then and the because so if you see it's, uh, it reads, if local planning, decision-making, and water management processes at national devolved levels are improved and resources are provided for the improvement of water infrastructure, you have the outputs of the project, then climate resilience and water, water security of vulnerable communities will be enhanced in rural areas of Vanuatu, which is the overall goal. Um, so that's the paradigm shift, the impact, the overall goal resulting because of now I, we 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 did we added that resulting because of so you know that now you're going to put in the outputs uh, which are yeah. enhanced community awareness and capabilities upgraded infrastructure and the investments to address climate risks and impacts and the strengthened national water governance capacities yeah so, which you can um, see over here here and here those are those three elements that go into that because of yeah and um, you know we had the opportunity to work with um, the Pacific community um, on this uh, project. This project is called Enhancing Adaptation and Community Resilience by Improving Water Security in Vanuatu. It's all available online um, on GCF's website. Um, but then very, very briefly, the problem we were trying to address here that is like sort of twofold. You have the wash sector, which is already affected in many different ways. Um, by weather and climate events in Vanuatu, which then you have negative impacts on drinking water availability and uh, quality as well, and also in negative performance of sanitation and hygiene services. And this is particularly heightened, which is our narrative, which is what we found from the context analysis, et cetera, we did, is that it is heightened in the case of Vanuatu, um, which is a small island developing state and a highly climate vulnerable. So this, these are the different this is the context of how this was, uh, why this was designed actually. And mm -hmm. um, in, in, so we had obviously uh, Grant and I and uh, the, the project design team, S SPC, our, the actor entity, UNICEF um, and other WASH actors that we had stakeholder consultations with. And importantly, the gov government counterpart, it was clear that this project had to be really community owned uh, to succeed. Um, and use sort of the existing water policies and planning frameworks to scale it up. So that is why we have these outcomes, like communities are empowered to plan and manage climate resilient water resources. Communities have access to more water infrastructure and intern water security. Um, and then at the same time, we have that community part and then we have the national government part where we are using the existing processes, but we are um, sort of fine tuning and improving them as we go along. So there's a feedback yeah. loop there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, okay. I'm sorry to cut you off. And in terms of, you've got a lot more to say on it, but we're just yeah. running out of 
we've run out of time. We've gone over slightly. There's still quite a lot of people on the call. But um, I just want to run through the remaining questions that we haven't addressed. Um, and then um, and then we'll close it off. If you have to drop off, you can always get the, the recording as well and then jump to the end. Um, you'll get the recording, of course, and jump to the end and you can um, and you can just check in if we've covered that question. Is that okay, Debashmita? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah. Okay. Vladimir, you've said, are there any guidelines on developing a theory of change from the GCF? Are they, Debashmita? Um, um, I think it's sporadic, but it is there, definitely. Um, is it in the programming programming guide? Program, yeah, programming guide. Uh, half a um, page, I think, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think also a good place to start is if you're doing a WASH project, climate resilient WASH project such as this, look at one that has been approved and see what are the sort of, how, how it is being laid out. Hugely um, good recommendation. Go onto the GCF website, look at the project documents, download them, have a look what's been done before. There's masses to learn from that. You can learn what the GCF really wants. Um, for it. Um, Suzanne, you've asked, you have a question about the need for evidence. Sometimes our projects are cutting edge, innovations that must be tried, and we need to convince funders to support it, even in the absence of evidence that it works. How do you deal with that? That's yeah, it's a, a, yeah. Yeah, a tough yeah. one. Um, yeah. I think if I, if I think about um, um, the current uh, sort of things we are working on. One of the ways we are working on is health and early warning systems. And we, of course, have an understanding that um, it works, but bringing the climate change aspect to it through multilateral climate finance is, is sort of new. Um, I don't really have particularly an answer, but I think, I think in a way, um, there is also space for um, new, to, to do new things. If you're able to um, demonstrate it through academic uh, evidence, um, because sometimes academic mm -hmm. evidence exists before there's um, project experience evidence. Um, so um, that would be a point to start. That's where I'd start, yeah. I guess. It's also important to keep in mind the risk tolerance of different funds. Mm -hmm. so there are some funds who say what we're doing is scaling up something that's improved, that's proven. And in mm -hmm. most cases, the Green Climate Fund, Global Environment Facility are in that. You've got a proof of concept. You've gone through the testing of it. You've learned something about it. Now we're going to scale it. Other funds, I think I'm right in saying, say, NAMA, NAMA facility is much more mm -hmm. about innovation, about cutting edge. So identifying the right fund makes is, is important. Um, yes, and it. I also think your project design. So I think in if if it's um, uh, if it's something innovative and you don't actually have a lot of concrete evidence that this is going to work, you start out small, you pilot it in a way. And then what you have is very strong, uh, mon strong monitoring and evaluation component built into that project. So then you use the funding you've received to um, um, assess and uh, document the results you're having so that it's re ready for scaling up. In a yeah. Way. yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, and hopefully that's a useful answer to you. Um, are there any specific things GCF particularly looks for in theory of change for climate change project in comparison to theory of change in general? The big thing is, is structure. GCF mm -hmm. looks for this structure and it's in the handbook. This is what they want. Structure it like that. No, no other funds have this structure for a mm -hmm. theory of change. It's a very specific tool for them. That's the big thing. Okay, um, and let's see. I think we've touched on many of these. Um, I've answered, Joseph, uh, your question about the mathematical and um, aspect of it and the um, access at the end of the presentation. I think that's it. Thank you so much for all of you that have been 
with us all this way um, through. It's It's been great to be here with you and still many people are on the call. Thank you very much. A huge thank you, Debish Mita, for the, um, the inputs and insights. It's been great to speak with you about theories of change, get excited a little bit about theories of change. It's been great. Huge thanks to Mariella and Jack um, who have been there in the background making sure everything works. So huge thank you for attending. You will receive the replay kit uh, via the email you signed up with, um, with the recording and the slide deck. If you have questions, you can contact me directly. Email is grant at ecoltdgroup.com. Um, and we'll send you further communications. There's a few links there on the page. Uh, please feel free to um, connect with us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and even on Instagram um, and via our website. So it's uh, it's been fantastic to, um, to spend this time with you. Hope you have found it valuable um, and can do great theories of change um, into the future. Thank you so much.